Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Parsons Technical Webinar Series. I'm your host, Jessica Bennett. Today, we have with us Tracy Oveby and Christy Diller presenting on advances in in situ treatment technologies for 1 4 dioxane remediation. Next slide, please. Uh, a few housekeeping items up front. We'll be keeping all phone lines muted throughout the presentation to keep background noise down. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can enter them in the chat at any time and we'll answer them at the end during the Q&A session, or you can hold them until the Q&A session at the end and either enter them in the chat at that time or raise your hand to ask them live. This webinar has been approved for one PDH credit or professional development hour. If you'd like to receive credit for attending today, you can uh, go to the link that will be provided in the chat a couple times throughout the presentation. There is a form there you'll need to fill out, including four multiple choice questions that you will need to answer. If you have any issues downloading or accessing that form, um, please let us know and we'll get that to you after the webinar. Uh, we'll also be posting the questions in the chat so that if you have any issues uh, accessing the form throughout the presentation, you can still uh, know which questions to be looking for to answer later. And finally, this technical webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel next few days. So a brief agenda for today's presentation. Uh, first, I'll introduce our two guest speakers, followed by the core value moment, the technical presentation, and then we'll wrap up with Q&A at the end. So a little bit about our two speakers today. Uh, Tracy ha is a senior project manager at Parsons. She has over 21 years of experience in environmental investigations and remediation, including for various emerging contaminants. She has a bachelor's and master's in biology and environmental studies, as well as an MBA. Christy is a project geologist at Parsons with over 17 years of experience in, in environmental investigation and remediation. She specializes in in situ groundwater remediation and investigation, as well as the investigation and cleanup of emerging contaminants. Christy has a master's in geological sciences and is a professional geologist in California, Oregon, and Wyoming. And with that, I'll hand it off to Tracy for the core value moment. Thank you. Yep, as we said, we want to start off with the core value uh, moment. And in Parsons, we know our six core values, safety, quality, integrity, diversity, innovation, and sustainability. And um, what I'm going to talk about um, can impact several of these. Uh, next slide, please. So what I want to talk about today is uh, considerations for changing environmental conditions. And this is something that we often encounter in our projects, especially with field work. Um, we have changing conditions that are outside of what we expect. Even sometimes um, we know that there might be changing conditions, but uh, they're even worse than we expect. Um, this can impact several of our of our core values. It could impact quality if we have to change on the fly how we're doing things that can, you know, impact our quality and how we're able to um, provide for what we said we would have for the client. Can also um, maybe impact sustainability if we have to use additional time or resources. Um, but the main thing that it often impacts and what I'm going to focus on today and how it kind of ties in with what we did in this project is safety. Um, it's the most important one when you have changing conditions um, because you don't always have the ability to plan for those conditions and the safety considerations can really impact what you're doing. So on this site, we did um, a bunch of field work and we started earlier this year, kind of in the summertime, and we were heavily into our excavation work when a hurricane uh, came through. It was actually Tropical Storm Adelia you might have heard of, and it had went back and forth between being a tropical storm and a hurricane and it came right through and hit right where we were working on um, coastal in the coastal South Carolina area. Um, we had to stop work. We had to decide um, on the fly when we would, you know, stop the job, shut it down, um, which days we would be out of the project, how we would button down the site for high winds, um, potential flooding issues. I um, mean, all of that was having to be done, you know, while we were in the field and still trying to meet our objectives and do our work for the client. Um, so it was difficult. We had those changing conditions to manage. Um, and we also had to be mindful of other things like how it was impacting the mindset of our of our employees and our subcontractors that were on site because 
you know, often we don't think about the fact that those changing conditions, you've got a big storm coming, people aren't focused anymore on their work, they're not focused on being, they're not as focused on being safe, uh, because their mind is elsewhere and trying to plan for how their own property, their families might be affected. So we had to take all of that into consideration. Um, the other things kind of at this time of year that we really have to think about for environmental changing conditions is the seasonal variations, um, right? Especially at this time of year, you know, we're preparing for temperature swings, potential wintry conditions, especially where we work in the southeastern region. It can be very cold in the morning, but then get hot by midday. Um, so you have to think of those changing conditions when you're building in for safety. We have to have PPE that can be removed where we can wear heavy coats in the morning and then shed those layers to have, you know, just a one T-shirt on in the middle of the day um, so we don't have anybody getting overly hot. We also have to have shade and water and everything available, even though it's fall or winter time, might not be something we generally think of, but the conditions are changing so rapidly. And the last one is also, you know, the time change just recently occurred. We're still out there doing field work. Um, that means we might be preparing now in the dark or uh, leaving the site and buttoning up at night in the dark. Um, we weren't used to that. You know, we've got to potentially have extra lighting on site. Um, as well as when we're driving, um, you're, you know, now there's reduced light for driving, as well as the, the sun might be shining from a different direction than you're used to. So all of those changing conditions can really impact the safety considerations for a project. And the best thing that we, we do is we just try to plan for every eventuality. It does take a lot more forethought and a lot more, you know, monitoring of the weather, um, thinking about it, trying to adjust and having additional equipment that you might not normally think about. Um, but those are the ways that we really try to um, mitigate any safety considerations from changing conditions. But that's all I have for that. Christy, do you wanna take it? Thanks, Tracy. Um, as just mentioned in the introduction to the webinar, today we'll be focusing on remediation of 1,4-dioxane. I'm going to start with a few slides that introduce the chemical, and then we'll move into a site-specific example where we're using innovative in-situ remedial approaches to treat 1,4-dioxane. 4-dioxane uh, is a synthetic organic compound, which was historically used in a variety of industrial applications, and it's frequently used as a stabilizer for the chlorinated solvent 1-1-1-trichloroethane, also called 1-1-1-TCA. Uh, because of its use in conjunction with 1-1-TCA, 1-4-dioxane uh, is frequently found in commingled plumes with um, other chlorinated solvents. And the graphic shown here, which is from the Interstate Technology and Regulatory Council, or ITRC's guidance document about 1,4-dioxane, uh, the light blue polygon in the background shows historical production of 1,4-dioxane, which really started around 1930, had a maximum in 1985, and then dropped off in the 1990s and beyond. And that drop off in the 90s was largely tied to the reduced use of 111 TCA after regulatory changes limited the use of that chemical. In the early 2000s, laboratory analytical methods for the detection of 14 dioxane were vastly improved, and there was documentation of widespread occurrence of the chemical in the environment. Um, in the early 2010s, EPA determined that 1,4-dioxane is a likely carcinogen to humans and started development of regulations for 1,4-dioxane. So in response to EPA's classification of 1,4-dioxane as likely to be carcinogenic to humans, federal and state governments have developed laws and regulations to address potential exposure to 1,4-dioxane. In 2013, EPA first established regional screening levels for 1,4-dioxane. The EPA RSL for tap water is 0.46 micrograms per liter. Uh, some states have applied that value to sites in their states, and those states are shown in the orange color on this map. States then, which have implemented their own levels or standards for water, are shown in either green, yellow, or blue depending on what type of standard or media it applies to. Uh, and you'll notice some states um, like California and Florida, there are multiple values shown. Uh, this means that that state has varying regulations. California, for example, has a 
drinking water notification level of one microgram per liter, a public protective level of three micrograms per liter, and a response level. Um, that is the level at which water systems must remove a source of water from service um, of 35 micrograms per liter. Uh, what you'll notice is that a majority of U.S. states now have promulgated standards for 1,4-Dioxane. The site that we'll be discussing as our case study is in South Carolina. On this map, uh, you can see South Carolina doesn't have a specific regulatory standard for 1,4-Dioxane. However, that doesn't mean that they're not paying attention to the chemical in the environment. Uh, we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. Um, the chemical and physical properties of 1,4-Dioxane make it unique. A low Henry's Law constant means it has a low potential for volatilization in the liquid phase. It has a low organic carbon partitioning coefficient, which results in low affinity for organic carbon. It's also non-ionic or uncharged, uh, which means it does not bond strongly to soils or sediment and readily leaches into groundwater or surface water. Uh, the density is close to that of water, and it's fully miscible in water. Uh, these properties are very different than the chlorinated solvent co-contaminants it's typically found with. And because of that, it's not expected to be attenuated via the same pathways relevant for chlorinated compounds. Methods that you typically apply for chlorinated solvents, such as anaerobic bioremediation, air sparging, chemical reduction using zero valent iron, these are less feasible for 1,4-dioxane treatment, given the unique properties of 1,4-dioxane. So that does make remediating 1,4-dioxane more challenging. Remedial actions implemented at a site to treat the chlorinated solvents probably weren't having much of, a, of an effect on the 1,4-dioxane contamination. Uh, this image from the ITRC guidance document shows viable options for 1,4-dioxane. F shown after the technology name indicates it's a fully demonstrated technology, and E indicates it's an emerging technology. You'll see um, pump and treat with exitu treatment is listed as fully demonstrated, and the only in situ option listed as fully demonstrated is phytoremediation. All the other in situ remedies still have at least one foot in the emerging technology category. Today, uh, we're eventually going to hone in on metabolic bioremediation as the selected remedy for our subject site. But before I talk about that part of our site's story, Tracy will give you an introduction to the site and some of the early remedial work that's been completed there. Tracy, take it away. Okay, thank you, Christy. Um, yes, I'm going to talk a bit about the site oper operational history of the property that we're dealing with here. Um, the, sh the site, as you can see here from this historical aerial photograph, is located in coastal South Carolina. Um, it was about five acres in size and had two main buildings, uh, the large warehouse uh, in the south that's shown in the south, and then um, to the north is um, a T-shaped building. Um, this is a was a formerly a PAX Park cleaning uh, facility and also a combination office space. Um, and that what they did was they cleaned, they brought uh, spinning components from a nearby manufacturing plant that made non-woven fabrics and brought them over here to this warehouse area for cleaning. So they would bring the spinnerets over and and use solvents to clean off when they got plugged up. Um, that was uh, operations were began in 1975 and they continued into the early 90s um, and the cleaning process involved emerging fully immersing the parts into the cleaning solution that contained one for dioxane and then they would rinse them do a water rinse the water rinse was collected in a sump and discharged to an on-site septic system until about 1982 and then after that point they started taking the wastewater transporting it off-site for disposal. But up until then, the wastewater was just collected in the sump and then released to a, a septic tank and associated leach field that was directly behind the building. And you can see where that's located from this map. 
Um, in the early in early 2003, a significant portion of the site was divested to private owners, and this included the warehouse, the large warehouse space in the front, um, and the divestiture included a deed restriction that prohibited any groundwater use on site. And the property that remained with the clients was about one acre, and it was in the back where that T-shaped building had been. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of the conceptual site model, um, and this shows a cross section um, from west to east across the facility. Uh, there's a shallow aquifer that's about three feet below ground surface. Um, it's been identified to have discontinuous layers characterized as interbedded silt, clay, and sand. Um, it ranges from about two feet to less than 14 feet thick. Um, groundwater flow in that shallow zone is primarily west to northwest, and the shallow aquifer is nat naturally anoxic, and groundwater flow through there is very slow. The seepage velocity is less than 40 feet a year. Um, that shallow aquifer is underlain uh, by a thick marl unit. It's about 80 to 100 feet thick, and it's a very tight mixture of clay and silt-sized grains that acts as an aquaclude, and it generally prevents downward migration of the contaminants through that um, to the deeper zone. Um, the shallow aquifer is what has been identified as being impacted by 1,4-dioxane, also um, low, low, much lower levels of chlorinated so, uh, solvents. However, we haven't seen a significant soil contamination zone, so there's not any area where the soil has been seen. Um, there's no drinking water receptors for the shallow aquifer. As I said previously, the deed restrictions um, uh, do not allow for any groundwater use from the site. Um, there's no other sensitive receptors nearby. Um, however, because this site is in South Carolina, which has historically been an anti-degradation state, it doesn't allow any risk-based approach to remediation. So all groundwater has to be cleaned up to drinking water standards. And we've done a lot of work, um, Parsons, with our client, have done a lot of advocacy work with the state, trying to present the benefits of a risk-based remediation strategy, especially for a site like this where there's not any sensitive receptors, um, no completed pathways for, for risk. Um, and so last year, the state did pass legislation allowing the development of site-specific remediation standards that would be based on risk. However, that program is just being implemented. They don't have South, South Carolina uh, Department of Health and Environmental Control doesn't have it set up yet, and they don't have um, the needed um, personnel or staff to really implement that yet. So we're kind of in a holding pattern based on whether or not we could ever use that as a risk approach for this site. Um, however, since we were already kind of starting off our remedial action and we had a plan for this site, uh, we're moving forward because it's a very good site to use um, as an experimental pilot test site where we can look at emerging contaminate, emerging technologies for 1,4-dioxane treatment and see if, you know, what might work. Um, and what you know, what might have, what might be effective, and what we might can use in a larger scale or other sites, uh, especially since this site doesn't have any ongoing activity either. Um, all, also, all drinking water wells in the area are installed below that tight marl area, so you wouldn't have any shallow groundwater really used as a drinking water source, even any anywhere else around the site. Okay, next slide, please. We'll Um, so we have a long history of investigation at this site. Um, we started investigation in the mid 80s, um, and that was just based on um, particular requirements from the client when they were looking at historical site usage. Um, we did show 1,4-dioxane, and then again, like we said, lower level VOCs, but majority is 1,4-dioxane. Um, in 1995, the building, the T building in the back was demolished, and it left behind just the building foundations. The warehouse did remain, and that was what was being used by the um, divested uh, private owners. Um, we started a, a long-term groundwater monitoring program in 2001 uh, just to assess environmental conditions, groundwater conditions in the site, and kind of determine um, where we were at with the site. 
In 2004, we also did an under slab sampling program. Um, so the slabs remained at that T building where the former uh, Pack Park Pax Parts cleaning facility had been. And we wanted to look under that to determine if there were any potential remaining um, source areas that could be contributing to the down gradient plume. So it went under the foundations, did um, did some drilling through the foundations, collected soil samples, but there wasn't any smoking gun soil source identified. It was just low levels of stuff that we saw similar to elsewhere on the site, and there were no pockets of, of any kind of, you know, concentrated 1,4 dioxane. Um, in 2018, we also did a lower aquifer investigation. Um, we installed some wells below that marl level, pretty deep in the couple few hundred feet down. Um, we did not uh, find any impacts really from site contamination. Um, so those wells were abandoned recently as well, and the state um, did agree that there hadn't been any impacts below the marl. So our current on-site monitoring well network monitors just the shallow aquifer. Okay, next slide. So this site, this slide shows um, one of our uh, groundwater plumes from 2017. This is really when we really started um, looking at what our remedial actions were going to be going forward. Um, as you can see, this is our, our highest concentration that we've seen recently is uh, 29,000 micrograms per liter uh, just behind the building, um, which is where the sump and leach field would be coming out from. Um, and on the other side, um, the there's a railroad track that runs behind the facility and that's a railroad right away easement um, just on the other side of that you have concentrations up to about 560 micrograms per liter um, we have um, a thought and attempted to do some additional downgrading investigation just to see if there was any uh, get a better handle on what's going off the site however that's been limited by access issues from uh, property owners that are to the west um, so we we might in the future um, be cont continuing with that. Uh, <clears throat> As we said earlier, we focused this investigation mostly on 1,4 dioxane. The reason this is only showing 1,4 dioxane groundwater plume is because we're talking about the 1,4 dioxane. Even though it is commingled with chlorinated VOCs, it has it's about four orders of magnitude higher. Um, of 1,4 dioxane concentrations. And so our investigation and our remedial efforts have been entirely focused on 1,4 dioxane. And looking at this, you can see that the historical source does appear to be that former septic tank and leach field and the wastewater collection sump that were right behind the building. You can see the highest concentration seen you know, right where. Okay, uh, next slide. So we did um, want to kind of look at this site for some remediation, obviously, before we said um, there wasn't a risk based strategy allowed, so we had to look at cleaning it up as best as we can. Um, we started off in 2007. Uh, our client voluntarily installed a pilot scale phyto remediation system. Um, this was something that was more back then. It was less um, less acknowledged. It had been used successfully at several sites, but it was something that was more of an emerging uh, technology. And so we wanted to see if it would be a good fit for this site. Um, the objective was that we would try to just accelerate contaminant removal and destruction and also potentially minimize the migration of constituents through in groundwater using hydraulic control if the trees were taking up a bunch of water. Um, the system was installed as three tree stands, each consisting of 14 white willow trees. Um, a full scale design would have had an expanded amount of trees. However, we really just wanted to see do this as a pilot test to see if it would work. Um, and there weren't any final remediation goals established. As we said, South Carolina doesn't have a, a remediation standard for 1,4 dioxane. So we just really wanted to see if it was going to be a good option for the site. And, you know, the goal was to make improvements to the overall site conditions. Um, and we had seen by 2011, so within four or five years, the trees had flourished and they were up to up to as high as 45 feet tall in some locations, about 30 to 45 feet tall. Um, and they grew from just the little willow, uh, willow wisps all the way up. And um, 
One thing to note with this phytoremediation system that we know is that the trees, um, the water, the groundwater here is, is very shallow. So you can see the groundwater when you look into the well. So it's about two, three feet below ground surface when you hit the saturated zone in that shallow aquifer. So these tree roots are very shallow. We did do some investigation and, you know, you don't see tree roots beyond a few feet down below ground surface. So the phyto trees in this system are only really taking water from the very top of the, of the aquifer, the shallow aquifer. Okay, next slide. So what we were hoping with the pilot test was to, was to, um, to show that the phytoremediation would be a good strategy for this site. Um, and phytoremediation is a set of processes using plants to destroy or remove contamination in groundwater and soil. And there are several mechanisms by which this can happen. And it has been shown to be effective to remediate 1,4-dioxane in soil and groundwater. So in this case, we, we know 1,4-dioxane is very miscible in water. It's taken up by the roots, um, transported throughout the tree tissue, and then out through the leaves. And what happens is it's it's uh, then uh, volatilized by or phyto volatilized. So it, it goes onto the leaves and it's hit by the UV light and then it's degraded in the atmosphere right around the trees by the UV light. Um, and that's a very effective system when it works. It's very effective. And uh, one concern, you know, we had was was with some concentrations of airborne one dioxane in the tree um, areas where we had heavy trees. If it's coming out through the leaves and being put into the atmosphere. ID checking that and we never found any detections that were in in the breathing zone for people. We don't have any personnel on site anyway, but it's very quickly broken down by the UV light exposure. So next slide. So we wanted to sample these and see how our pilot test was um, was going if it was working. Um, so in 2011, we went out, we took tree and uh, tree cores and leaf samples from a subset of the pilot system trees. We sampled nine trees. Um, they were analyzed for 1,4-dioxane as well as the site-specific VOCs and concentrations ranged from 46 to 148 ppb of 1,4-dioxane. And you can see that um, some of them had non-detects. It, it's very it's very obvious that the trees that were planted were more in, in line where the actual heavy part of the plume is. Um, you can see monitoring well MW05 right in the middle. That's a highly impacted monitoring well. Those trees that were around there had much more um, impacts. We saw much more 1,4-dioxane in the tree core and leaves. Um, than we did in the ones that were around the edges where they didn't it didn't get much, did come in contact with much of the plume water. So we definitely saw a correlation between the higher groundwater concentrations and higher um, tissue samples. Uh, however, there's not any way to directly correlate what we saw in the the core versus the groundwater. Just where it's higher, it's higher. Um, okay. Um, next slide, please. We also went back out in 2012 to do another sampling event and um, we did a bunch of tree measurements then and we had shown that the trees had grown approximately one inch in diameter per year. So that was good. These are quick growing trees and they, they will take up a bunch of water and grow pretty quickly. Um, we also wanted to see if we could figure out if the native trees were, um, in, were also contributing uh, phytoremediation to the site. So we went out, this is a heavily wooded area on the other side of the railroad tracks. And as we had seen from our earlier plume maps, um, we see much less of a detection offsite on the other side of the railroad tracks. Um, it, it drops off pretty quickly. So we, we think the plume is pretty contained just into those first initial areas on the other side of the railroad track. Um, but we wanted to see you know, what was driving this. So we went out, we sampled, um, Another, we took another 16 tree core samples. Uh, we did three tr three from the tree, our tree engineered tree system trees, and then 13 native tree samples, both right behind the site and on the other side of the railroad tracks. And we did see, uh, definitely, we saw 1,4-dioxane in the native trees as well. So that was good. It showed that the one the native system was also serving as a phytoremediation um, system for the site and helping us really contain that plume. And you can see where we kind of saw our plume getting decreasing a lot on the other side is 
pretty much lower. And that's where we also started to see non detects in the native trees. Um, OK, next slide. And I'm going to hand it back over to Christy at this point. Christy. All right, thanks, Tracy. Uh, so all the work that Tracy just discussed had documented that phytoremediation was working and was taking up 1,4-dioxane from the groundwater. However, unfortunately, that uptake of 1,4-dioxane by the trees wasn't making a significant difference in the 1,4-dioxane concentrations in the on-site groundwater monitoring wells. Here's a graph of 1,4-dioxane concentrations over time in some key site monitoring wells. Uh, the vertical green line represents when the phytoremediation remedy was installed. Um, you'd expect to see decreasing concentrations in MW5 and MW25, which are shown by the blue and purple lines. But instead, there was actually an increase a couple of years after the phytoremediation installation. Um, no one really understood why that was happening. Uh, but we considered that the phytoremediation trees were only taking 1,4-dioxane from the shallowest portion of the aquifer right at the water table and not having an impact on the full aquifer depth uh, where the monitoring wells were screened. Uh, the bottom line at this point of the study, site's story uh, was the, phyto, the phytoremediation pilot study, although it was working, was not sufficient enough on its own. Uh, the rate of contaminant concentration decline had been determined to be slower than desired, and the degree of contaminant mass flux reduction at the property line was lower than expected. Uh, so in response to a request from the state regulator, uh, the team assessed additional remedial options, which could be used for an upgraded remedy. We went back to the drawing board and started considering other remedial options. Uh, you may remember that I said some of the traditional methods used for chlorinated VOCs are less effective for 1,4-dioxane, so that meant ano anaerobic bioremediation, air sparging, and chemical reduction weren't in the running, uh, specifically chemical reduction by zero-valent iron. Uh, uh, back looking at this ITRC technology summary graphic, um, remember that I said pump and treat with ex situ treatment is a fully demonstrated option. But pump and treat is generally not cost effective, requires high upfront costs and long term operations and maintenance, um, not to mention disposal of the treated groundwater. Uh, we really wanted to focus on in situ remedies, especially those that would be considered green and sustainable. Uh, yes, phytoremediation was working at the site, so we did want to consider an expanded or upgraded phytoremediation system as part of the next phase of work. Uh, but we also wanted to pair that with another in situ option. The emerging options uh, for in situ treatment of 1,4-dioxane in groundwater include thermal in situ chemical oxidation, monitored natural attenuation, and aerobic bioremediation, either co-metabolic or metabolic. Um, co-metabolic bioremediation occurs when microorganisms fortuitously degrade a contaminant during microbial metabolism of another compound. So in that case, you may need to stimulate the microorganisms by adding an amendment such as propane or methane that they use as a primary substrate, and 1,4-dioxane ends up degraded as they're consuming that other contaminant. Whereas metabolic bioremediation means that microorganisms metabolize 1,4-dioxane as their sole source of carbon and energy. This process results in mineralization of 1,4-dioxane to carbon dioxide and increases the number of the 1,4-dioxane degrading microorganisms. For 1,4-dioxane, these bioremediation methods occur under aerobic conditions. So uh, there needs to be oxygen in the environment for the microorganisms to do their work. Uh, the option that really piqued the interest of the team and the client was in situ bioremediation. So the question became, could in situ bioremediation work at this site? Through a partnership with Clemson University, specialized laboratory tests were performed using site aquifer materials and Clemson researchers were able to identify and isolate a microbe now known as Pseudonicardia dioxinovorans strain Burke one This microbe grows aerobically 
with 1,4-dioxane as its sole substrate. So not that co-metabolic process I just described, but a true metabolic process. If you've researched 1,4-dioxane biodegradation, you've probably heard of a similar microbe called CB1190, which is one of the best characterized 1,4-dioxane metabolizing strains. These two are in the same gene family, but molecular tools have confirmed them as different strains. Uh, the images here show a glimpse of the water evaluated in Clemson's lab and scanning electron microscope images of the microbes. One noticeable difference is that BERK1 exhibits a reduced adherence to surfaces compared to those of CB1190, giving it an apparent advantage for movement through soil which could be advantageous for its use in bioremediation. Laboratory tests conducted at Clemson documented that BERK1 grows on 1,4-dioxane when concentrations of the contaminant are as high as 1,000 milligrams per liter, but also has the capability to degrade 1,4-dioxane to non-detect concentrations, which during that study were uh, less than 25 micrograms per liter. So, that all was good news in our journey to using in-situ bioremediation. Uh, but the team wanted to look at other site-specific lines of evidence to support success of a bioremediation remedy. We noted loss of mass in situ over time and space. Um, down gradient concentrations were not increasing over time. Some kind of attenuation process appears to be occurring as the groundwater moves down gradient. Through the Clemson work, we have now documented a biogeochemical mechanism for 1,4-dioxane degradation via BERK1 degraders. We have in-situ conditions conducive for that proposed mechanism? Well, not really, but we'll get to that next. Uh, we did have a long line of evidence for in-situ degradation. First, the presence of that aerobic metabolic degrader, BERK1, at the site. Second, after identifying the microbe, a variety of laboratory tests were performed at Clemson using site groundwater that documented that 1,4-dioxane was indeed mineralized to carbon dioxide. And finally, compound-specific uh, isotope analysis on samples from the site documented a progressive enrichment in hydrogen isotopes in groundwater samples collected along the downgradient plume axis, indicative of 1,4-dioxane degradation. Um, the chart here shows um, a source area well, um, where the delta H2 is a negative number. And then as you move into down gradient wells and a far down gradient well, um, enrichment of hydrogen is observed as progressively more positive delta H2 values are observed. So we've got all this great data pointing us towards a magical biodegradation process for 1,4-dioxane. But if that's the case, why aren't we seeing significant effects of that on the groundwater concentrations? Uh, you may remember that we said the shallow aquifer is naturally anoxic, but the BERK1 microbe does its magic under oxic conditions. So we next executed a data gap investigation at the site to see if we could tie aquifer conditions to 1,4-dioxane concentrations. We did a simple vertical aquifer profiling investigation using crab groundwater samples at various depths adjacent to existing monitoring wells and compared the 1,4-dioxane concentrations to dissolved oxygen and ORP by depth. The results of the data gap investigation did generally tie lower 1,4-dioxane concentrations to the shallow oxic portion of the aquifer, while 1,4-dioxane concentrations were higher in the deeper anoxic zone. Um, so this confirmed our conceptual site model, the natural biodegradation of 1,4-dioxane at the site is limited by oxygen availability. The BERK1 microbes are indigenous, they're there, they're, there, they're in the aquifer, but they just don't have the right oxic conditions for them to perform their aerobic degradation magic. Uh, so all that research led us to a new three-pronged approach for remedial enhancement. First, let's get rid of the building slabs and soil in the area shown by the blue dash line, just to eliminate the possibility of continuing source areas hiding there. Second, let's add some oxygen to stimulate biodegradation by the indigenous microbes 
And we've proposed to do that through installation of what we're calling an aeration trench across the source area as shown by the yellow line here. Um, so we've proven that in the laboratory that the, this technology can work and others have executed pilot studies of aerobic metabolic biodegradation of 1,4-dioxane. But this aeration trench will be a, a first of its kind in situ bioremediation approach for 1,4-dioxane. Um, and finally, we'll remove the existing phytoremediation tree stands and upgrade to a downgradient enhanced phytoremediation system using applied natural sciences tree well units in the areas shown in green. Now, this is a proprietary phytoremediation system that I'll explain in more detail later. So yep, in the coming slides now, I'll discuss each of these pieces of the puzzle in more detail. We started work in 2020 with removal of the building slabs and some soil removal. We removed the building foundations, which were in the areas shown by the dashed blue lines in the image on the left. During that process, we did identify and remove the old concrete sump, a photo of which is shown here in the middle. And finally, we also excavated Vado zone soil from the area where the leach field had been, which is the area shown by the blue polygon. And the couple photos on the right show what that excavation looked like. <laughs> um, then this summer, we completed installation of the aeration trench. As I said, this is a novel approach that has never been implemented at this scale for 1,4-dioxane remediation. This drawing shows the general design for the aeration trench, um, but this is just a snapshot showing uh, one end of the trench. The whole trench is about 140 feet in length, uh, but the length shown here on the, the left part of the slide is, is less than 25 feet long. Uh, top portion here shows uh, a cross-section view of the design, while the bottom portion shows a plan view. Uh, the trench is about four feet wide and about 13 feet deep down to the top of that the marl aquaclude. We inst installed nine vertical spar twelves at the trench, which will be used for air injections for biostimulation. Um, the drawing here shows just two of those vertical spar twelves. Uh, in addition, we also installed horizontal piping in the bottom of the trench. Uh, which could be used for groundwater extraction. If our in-situ remedy doesn't go to plan and we need to pivot the future to an ex-situ remedy, it's always good to have a backup plan. Throughout the trench, we also installed monitoring point clusters um, shown on the right. Um, those are groups of monitoring points at various depths. Um, and we also included a couple of specialized sensors, which will help us document if we're reaching the optimal oxygen distribution and aquifer conditions throughout the trench. Um, I'll talk more about those specialized sensors in a few slides. The trench was then backfilled with permeable gravel and capped with clean overburden to the ground surface. Uh, this slide shows some photos of the trench during installation. First, we excavated the four foot wide trench down to the top of the aquaclude. Trench boxes were used to keep the trench open and ensure safety. Uh, the piping for the horizontal wells at the bottom and the vertical air sparge wells and monitoring point clusters were placed. And then the trench was backfilled with permeable gravel around that piping. The picture on the right shows the skid steer about to drop a load of backfill into the trench. Um, and just a fun fact, uh, while I was out there collecting samples for additional research with Clemson University and Colorado State University, I found a sharp tooth in one of the deeper soil samples. Um, that's what's shown in that bottom left picture. I was more than a little bit surprised to be poked by that sharp thing, um, but very impressed to find a tooth that's likely millions of years old. Uh, these pictures show the aeration trench while the finishing touches were being put on it. Uh, the permeable backfill was uh, put up to about four feet below ground surface, and then the trench was backfilled with clean overburdened soil to grade. Each of the sparge wells or monitoring clusters are housed in a flush mounted irrigation box shown in the left and center photos. 
um, which will allow us the flexibility to finalize the design of the air injection piping and systems later after we do some initial optimization testing of the trench. Um, and then the horizontal wells are housed in metal well vaults in a concrete pad at either end of the trench. Um, that's what's shown on the right hand slide and, and the green mulch you could see in that picture was applied as part of the reseeding process at the site during site restoration. Um, finally, in the center photo, the specialized sensor system that I mentioned is visible as the box mounted on the post. Uh, to talk more in depth about those sensors, uh, which so we installed two sensors in the trench and we'll also be installing additional up gradient and down gradient sensors around the trench next week. Um, these are made by a company called Sense Technologies, founded by a graduate of Tom Sales Research Group at Colorado State University. Uh, they developed cellular connected environmental monitoring systems, which can provide real time data uh, for ORP and water levels. Shown in the center of the slide is a 3D rendering of what a system looks like, where the sensors are all below ground attached to a two inch PVC pipe and the solar powered antenna system is in a box above the ground surface. Also shown on the right are a couple pictures of the sensors ready to go before we installed them into the ground. Finally, the graphic on the left is just the first look at data we got in October as the systems were adjusting to the aquifer. Um, these show ORP by depth on the X axis and time on the Y axis with green and blue colors showing a negative ORP. We installed sensors every two feet vertically throughout that trench sensor. And this graphic shows that baseline conditions in the trench are indeed rather reducing with ORP values primarily in the negative 200 to negative 300 range shown by the blue colors um, and the positive ORP values representing oxidizing conditions only in the shallowest portion of the trench. So once we turn the aeration trench system on, the concept is that we'll see an increase in ORP values to positive, which will indicate oxidizing conditions. Um, having been achieved in the full vertical aquifer column. Here's an additional example of data. This isn't from our site, but just shows the variety of options for how data from the sense systems can be plotted to see variations in the data over time. Uh, we'll specifically be using them to track ORP within the trench and immediately up gradient, down gradient of the trench. And then we'll also be using sense transducers to monitor the water level up gradient within and down gradient of the phytoremediation plot so that we can evaluate the hydraulic control that the upgraded phytoremediation system is providing. We'll use the sensors for real-time site monitoring and for site alerts to let us know when the aeration trench system is no longer keeping the environment at our target ORP range. Um, and then in September, we also installed um, the new phytoremediation system with ANS using their proprietary tree well system. Uh, the graphic on the left is a sketch of that system from ANS, um, and the two photos show the installation process at the site. We installed 26 tree well units along the down gradient edge of the property for hydraulic control and for contaminant degradation. So these are a specialized system that targets more than just the shallow water table. Uh, the tree well system uses a root sleeve liner to seal off the shallowest portion of the aquifer and encourage roots to extract groundwater from the deepest portion of our target aquifer. In addition, the tree well unit acts as a bioreactor where aerobic microbial degradation can occur. Um, in addition, to all the phytoremediation mechanisms that Tracy discussed earlier. Um, so for now, the, the tree wells have been installed, uh, meaning that that root sleeve liner and the rest of the below ground parts of the system have been installed. Um, but we're waiting a few months to actually plant the new trees as there's um, typically better success with tree survival if you plant just before the growing season starts. I wanna leave you with just a few key takeaways for this presentation. Uh, First off, we demonstrated natural aerobic biodegradation of 1,4-dioxane was possible, but that it was limited by the natural anoxic aquifer. Uh, we designed and installed a novel engineering approach 
an aeration trench, which will be used to enhance aerobic bioremediation by biostimulating the indigenous Burke one microbes. In addition, we installed an enhanced phytoremediation system using ANS's tree wells units, which will focus on the phytoremediation trees, uh, growing their roots into the deeper portion of the aquifer, providing better hydraulic control. In the coming months, we'll be doing some preliminary optimization tests of the sparge wells in the aeration trench, and, and then we'll move to full-scale startup. As I said before, this is a first-of-its-kind approach using an aeration trench for in-situ aerobic bioremediation for 1,4-dioxane. In the future, hopefully we can come back and give an updated technical webinar discussing lessons learned during operations of the system and uh, to present performance monitoring results. In the meantime, the bottom line for this presentation is that aerobic in-situ bioremediation should be considered for 1,4-dioxane sites. Um, first, you need to assess the presence or absence of native, native bacteria to see if biostimulation is possible or if you'd also need to factor in bioaugmentation. Um, and second, understand how the nat natural aquifer characteristics may affect those biodegradation processes. Finally, Consider how any other co-contaminants may affect your remedy. High concentrations of other contaminants may have an inhibitory effect on 1,4-dioxane biodegradation, but there's research out there suggesting that a sequential anaerobic and aerobic treatment of CVOCs and 1,4-dioxane is feasible. Um, aerobic metabolic biodegradation and the other emerging in-situ options have great potential to be significantly more cost-effective and more sustainable than the currently accepted pump-and-treat remedial approach for 1,4-dioxane treatment. Um, and I'm sure all these in-situ options will continue to develop rapidly in the coming years. Um, and Parsons is excited to be on the forefront of establishing aerobic bioremediation as a fully demonstrated technology for 1,4-dioxane. Thanks for listening, and thanks to our client, our Parsons colleagues, especially the field crew who spent long days safely executing the field work during South Carolina's hot and humid summer months, and then all the partners listed here um, for their contributions to this work. And with that, I'll pass it back to Jess to lead the Q&A session. Yeah, thank you so much, Tracy and Christy. That was a great presentation. Uh, on an emerging contaminant that gets uh, a lot less attention these days, um, given um, all the focus on PFAS. So um, great to see that there's still being uh, lessons, you know, things progressing for remediation of one for axane. So if you have any questions, you can either answer them into the chat and we'll read them out, or you can raise your hand and you can ask it live. Either Either option works. So I see a few already in the chat. Um, a question from Beth Badick. Is there a synergy between the phytoremediation system and aerobic bioremediation, or are those opposing processes, and that's why one had to be positioned down gradient of the other? I'll take that one. Um, yeah, definitely synergistic. Um, in these engineered phytoremediation systems, the plants extract impacted groundwater through the root uptake, and like those plants help to maintain highly oxic conditions in the root zone, um, creating potentially ideal conditions for establishing like a, a bioreactor for 1,4-dioxane biodegradation. Um, so the tree wells themselves are helping to add oxygen to the aquifer. Um, the, the native bacteria there should thrive in the aerated tree well soil column, um, such that there's both biodegradation occurring and all the phyto processes. Uh, the only reason that we really positioned those like down gradient of each other is that we wanted the aeration trench to be like closer into the source area and then for the phyto remediation system to serve more as like a down gradient hydraulic control mitigating flux of 1,4-dioxane near the property boundary. Okay, great. Uh, I see Jim shoots. Uh, you have your hand raised. If you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. And great presentation, Tracy and Christine. I really enjoyed it. Um, I liked uh, seeing all the background and all the research that went into selecting um, the chosen remedial option. Uh, the question I have is, 
have you thought about or did it come up during you know pilot testing and or early feasibility uh, discussions on doing an in situ oxidation type of treatment prior to you know an aerobic um, trench like you had installed and and or what are your thoughts generally of even with that trench let's say if you wanted to boost the remediation of 1,4-doxing, could it be used um, as an application for an oxidant and then later on transition to aerobic um, degradation uh, with microbial populations? Thanks, Jim. Good question. Uh, by, by the time I came into this project, the, uh, the sparge system had already been the chosen remedy. So I can't speak much to how much it was debated in the past. Um, but yeah, it does seem like it could be an option. I mean, we, we are kind of setting ourselves up for being able to uh, be flexible and pivot when necessary. So um, I, I know that in situ oxidation processes are emerging and generally being more and more developed for 1,4-dioxane remediation. So yeah, certainly something you could consider. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, I know for another site, 1,4-dioxane, um, some time ago we looked at ozone. I think that was what we were looking at, something similar to what you, you did here with the trench, um, but applying it, applying ozone to the uh, to the subsurface, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, and I will say, Jim, this Tracy, I, I, we did do some, our engineers did do some back and forth discussions about some of that stuff earlier on. Um, we had already, obviously, we already did FIDO, we already went with FIDO, and we kind of were looking at ways we could enhance FIDO at first. So we were really focusing on just expanding the FIDO pilot system, getting more trees in there, doing the tree wells. And then we started looking at the trenching system. And so we, you know, because we were like, oh, let's try this out, let's try that out. We weren't necessarily looking at every single option, but yes, in the future, definitely we're gonna, we can look at other stuff. I mean, this is kind of a fun site to have the option to try a few different things and see where we get the best, you know, best options. Great, thanks for answering my questions and thanks for the presentation, I appreciate it. Uh, I see Ted Schoenberg, um, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please go ahead. Sure, thanks. I wanted to piggyback on the discussion that Jim just led um, with advanced oxidation. Uh, there's a site I, I worked on a little bit about 10 years ago down in Arizona where they were, it was, it was actually pump and treat, but they were using ozone. I mean, advanced oxidation processes have been one of the, you know, successful ways to treat 1,4-dioxane. The one thing to consider, and I'm not sure how much of a factor this would be if you're doing it in situ, but um, that type of process tends to generate bromate. And that was something that, um, you know, you can you can kind of dial your ozone dose to possibly mitigate against that, but it's something to take into consideration. I know it's not really related to the presentation that Christy and Tracy gave, but just I didn't want to mention that. Yeah, it's no, a, a negative side effect. Yeah, I mean bromate. There is a there's a there's a um, a federal MCL, I believe, of ten micrograms per liter. So if you have brom if you have bromide, which does occur, and 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 bromide was present in this particular location, and and I mean and you know something like that. I mean that could that in that you know going forward when you do these investigations to see if the type of system that Tracy and Christy described may be applicable. I'm wondering if you know that would be a, you know something to think about like well you don't want to do pump and treat and and do an advanced oxidation because you may generate bromide that kind of thing so it's you know it, it may it may justify the extra engineering or whatever it would take to make it amenable to bio to enhance bioremediation thanks for adding that in Ted that's useful information and yeah like the the cool thing about the bio bioremediation is there there are no negative byproducts. Mm -hmm. uh, I see we got another question in the chat. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, again, please raise your hand or you can enter your question in the chat. Uh, from Georgia Kaplan, uh, given that the trees contained 1,4-dioxane, what were the disposal requirements for the existing phytoremediation trees that were cut down as part of the recent work? Uh, 
So that's a great question. Um, early on, that was like one of the first things the regulators ask because um, they ask, you know, is this going to be a hazardous waste for disposal? Is there going to be any issues? And it isn't a hazardous waste. It's nothing that we were really concerned about. Um, we knew it would be farther down the road that we'd have to deal with tree disposal. But um, but we did during this cut them down. And um, what we had talked about with the regulator, which was agreed to, is just laying them out on site to dry out and to be exposed to UV light for a while. And once they are, once they get dried out, I mean, they're pretty much non-detect anymore for 1,4-Dioxane. And then we just chipped them up and use them as mulch on site where they'll get more UV exposure if there's anything left. But um, but yeah, just let them dry it out and, um, and then we were good to go. Okay, uh, I don't see any more questions, but you still have a couple minutes left. Um, if we can go to the next slide. Actually, oh, there's one. A couple more. Uh, is it known yeah, how long? Yeah, no, sorry about that. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> is it known how long the sensors can last? Uh, is there any concern that site conditions, weather, or anything else could affect them? And do they make other types of sensors? Uh, so, in terms of, uh, I'll start with the other sensors. So, right now, um, Sense makes only uh, ORP water level and temperature they they may have others in development and perhaps but i'm not aware of them um so, uh and in terms of how long they can last um uh, i don't know that they've had testing for that we are hoping they're going to last a long time i mean they're below ground so they should hold up well um they have small solar panels so you may need to work with sense if you're at a site where you don't get a lot of uh, solar input that you might need a larger solar panel on them or something or like if they get covered by snow you might need to like have a plan to clear them off um, luckily at this site in south carolina we have lots of sun and no big weather concerns and i mean the cool thing about them is if they turn off for a little bit then they'll come back once the solar panel does get um, the sun it needs. Um, and yep, I think that answered all of your questions there. I mean, one thing to note is if you do Google Sense Technologies, um, be sure to spell their name right. It's a three as the first E, so like a backwards E. Um, otherwise, you'll end up confused about why you can't find the right company like I did the first time I was looking them up. So Sense with a three. Uh, and we'll take one last question um, from Hao Zhang. Do you need to design or build the tree well units specifically for the site? Yeah, so ANS um, is a subcontractor we use. So those are proprietary systems and they did the whole design. They did come out to the site and do just a little bit of advanced testing to make sure that the soil understood what the agronomic properties of the soil and groundwater were and they then build in a special amendment mix. And um, the root sleeve liner and like the size of the tree well itself is, is designed specifically for each site. Um, and then even I think the mix of trees that they'll use is also a site specific consideration. So yeah, if you have a site where you're interested in using those, um, I have contacts, I'm happy to pass them on to you at, for Applied Natural Sciences. All right, great. Well, if there's any other questions, um, we're going to wrap up for today, but please feel free to reach out, reach out to our presenters uh, directly after the webinar. Um, a link to the PDH form was posted in the chat a couple times. Um, if you have any issues downloading that PDH form, um, please, please let us know. And if you miss any of the uh, content related to answering those questions, the recording of this webinar will be up on our YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, our next webinar will be in January 2024. Uh, further details will be posted in the next uh, month or two about the schedule and details about the January webinar. Um, thank you again to everybody who joined us for today's webinar, and we hope to see you again in January.